Let's start with just a quick overview of the basics of nerve transfers. And then we'll move in from the how and why to the actual real technical component. So we're all aware of the fact that the impact of a proximal nerve injury can be devastating with respect to functional recovery because of the distance the nerves have to regenerate and the fact that the motor end plates will degenerate over time. We also know from fairly recent research that the pathway itself, the Schwann cells in particular, along that pathway will become senescent over time. And even if the axons regenerate, those axons as they regenerate are not supported by healthy Schwann cells. So the Schwann cells are stressed out in the pathway and the distal target with respect to the motor end plates um, is a problem over time. And there is just a window of months after which there's irreversible atrophy and you can't recover function. June Kobayashi uh, with our group and the group in Ann Arbor did a study that looked at reconstruction of nerve injuries um, after two weeks, a month, three months, up to 12 months, and then looked at functional recovery after that period of time. And what we saw wasn't a slow dwindle of functional recovery. It was a privileged period of time after which there was really very little recovery. So there is a window, and the window that we generally talk about is 12 months. The time that we usually will try to reinnervate at if we know that there's not going to recovery is three to four months. And I think in general, the sooner the better in complete transaction uh, injuries so we can avoid this problem with permanent damage and no functional recovery. The number of nerve fibers in a second study also paralleled the force and function that recovered so that there's a rapid drop after a privileged uh, period of time. This fits with Tessa Gordon's work where she looked at functional recovery over the um, amount of connection with the motor neuron pool. So you can see in this uh, figure that the functional recovery and the function, function is strong as you lose uh, and the, and the um, as you lose neurons and the number of neurons connecting in the motor nerve pool decreases till about 70% loss and then rapid loss of function. This is a, I love this uh, uh, graph because it suggests that there's such potential for the nervous system to give us good function as we lose motor neuron connection until a critical point and then it's all gone, all lost. I think we see this in clinical situations frequently. This is seriously like the last straw that broke the camel's back. So 70% denervation, um, you lose function and you need to have about 30% for functional recovery. Who knows if those numbers are exact in a clinical situation, but the theme is that there the more, the more you lose, everything will be fine for a period of time and then just lo losing it completely. So th the regeneration rate, a millimeter a day, an inch a month, brachial plexus injuries take two or three years to reach the motor targets in the hand and they will not be receptive at that period of time. This is the cartoon that we like to use to emphasize this. And at this point, we do the measurement of the... Um, uh, cell body as the same height, if we extrapolate to the height of the gateway arch in St. Louis, how far we project the axon, it would go all the way up to Anchorage, Alaska. An injury at the U.S.-Canada border, no matter how you reconstruct that with a nerve graft or a repair or conduit or whatever, the axons as they regenerate, at the rate they regenerate, with that cartoon analogy there, it would take them a couple of years to reach Anchorage, Alaska, and there would be nobody in Anchorage, Alaska to receive those axons should they make it there over that period of time. A nerve transfer does this. It goes to Fairbanks, Alaska. It says, can you spare me food and water for your colleagues in Anchorage? And you just truck those 
supplies in from Fairbanks, Alaska. If you can imagine how much happier the people in Anchorage, Alaska are going to be than if you do the repair at the U.S.-Canadian border, that's actually the difference that I see with reconstruction with nerve transfers as compared to distant nerve repair or long nerve grafts. This is a case from the 1980s where I've harvested bilateral sural nerve grafts to do an upper brachial plexus reconstruction. I took this picture because I was proud of the result two or three years later. There's some elbow flexion, and you can see that from the look on that patient's eyes, he's not impressed with that M3 or M3 minus, I guess, elbow flexion. I thought that was a great result. And for the 1980s, it was a great result. By contrast, a similar upper plexus injury now treated with various nerve transfers, in this case, medial pec to axillary, thoracodorsal to musculocutaneous, a far better result and a much happier surgeon and patient. I should say patient and surgeon. What are the issues that uh, give us the poor results after nerve reconstruction? Proximal injuries, delayed repair, needing to do a nerve graft, needing to do long nerve grafts, and not knowing the internal topography of the um, nerves that are repaired and grafted. All of those four things are basically made a moot point when you do a nerve transfer. You get away from the proximal injuries and go close to target. You cut off months and months of regeneration so that the impact from the delayed repair is just not there. You don't need nerve grafts. And the whole premise of nerve transfers is based on knowledge of the internal topography of the peripheral nerves. As in most situations, you've got to know the classification of nerve injuries in order to know when to do a nerve transfer, when not to do a nerve transfer, who to do a nerve transfer on, who not to do a nerve transfer on. So we can look at Sunderland's classification, Seddon's classification, and really just think about those classifications as favorable and unfavorable. First, second, and third degree neuropraxia and um, axonotomatic injury are favorable. Fourth and fifth degrees aren't favorable. There's going to be fibrillations present in the second and third degree, no fibrillations in first degree because it's a conduction block. Favorable injuries, first, second, and third, are going to recover. First degree, perfect fast. Second degree, perfect slow. Third degree, pretty good slow. Unfavorable, no recovery. Fibrillations, no motor unit potentials. Now, for the unfavorable, that, is the ind that would be an indica indication for an end-to-end -end nerve transfer. And all the way through here, we're coding the donor, which is working, as green, green for go, and the recipient, which isn't working, as red or pink. The indications for a nerve transfer are to get as many motor fibers you can get to the denervated muscle as quickly as possible, to find a source of expendable donor nerves as close as possible to the denervated muscle and the denervated end plates. To use an expendable, synergistic donor nerve with as many nerve fibers as you can use and find expendable. As pure a donor, and I put pure on that because 50% of motor nerve fibers are sensory afferent and get that donor nerve as close to the target muscle as possible. This mantra, donor distal recipient proximal, is key for a tension-free nerve transfer. So you're going close to target as possible, and you want no tension on your repair. So you forget that proximal injury over in the left uh, lower hand corner, and donor distal recipient proximal so that you have a nice overlap between the donor and recipient ends and you'll have no tension. Now what about a situation where you have an axonotomatic injury and you don't know if it's going to be a second degree, a great second degree recovery, albeit slow, or if it's going to be a third degree and not a perfect recovery. In those situations of the axonotomatic injuries where there's fibrillations present and motor units are present at three months, we've used this technique of supercharge or end-to-side nerve transfers 
to try to increase the probability of this giving us a result that is as close to normal function. We won't have normal bulk, but as close to normal function as possible. So we take those same nerves that we would go end to end and we sew it to the side of the nerve. Let's look at that cartoon again. So now we are repairing the injury um, at the US Canadian border, but we are going into Fairbanks, Alaska and to the side of that nerve adding expendable motor axons, food and water from Fairbanks to the side of that uh, nerve to get those uh, axons in there more quickly. Our greatest experience is with uh, trying to recover ulnar intrinsic motor function. This should make sense because there's so many um, cubital tunnel, for example, failed cubital tunnel procedures with ulnar intrinsic atrophy, which traditionally haven't been very responsive to simple operations at the elbow. And the importance of the ulnar intrinsic function with very few other ways to improve that, very few good tendon transfers to uh, rely on. So our indications for uh, supercharged nerve transfer of the distal end of the anterior interosseous nerve to the pronator quadratus to the ulnar intrinsic fascicular group in the um, distal forearm is as you see here. We would do that end to side transfer for high ulnar nerve injuries, if it was an axonotomatic injury, fibrillations and motor units present, so some continuity and hopes of primary recovery from the uh, native ulnar nerve. In patients with Martin Gruber's, where you don't want to lose that function coming from the median nerve to the ulnar nerve, those are the two indications for high ulnar nerve for a supercharge procedure to the side of the motor ulnar nerve. If it was a fourth degree injury or fifth degree injury, complete neurotomatic injury, unfavorable injury on a high ulnar nerve, we would go end to end. For a mid-level ulnar nerve, say something, you know, proximal forearm, mid forearm, where the opportunity for recovery is there because it's that not that's not that far from target, then we would add to that with a supercharge end side nerve transfer from the AIN to the motor component of the ulnar nerve. Cubital tunnel, failed cubital tunnel, acute uh, ulnar nerve uh, incontinuity injuries, where there's second and third degree patterns with fibrillations and motor units, we would do a nerve transfer to the side in that situation as well.